To start with, I would just like to let you know we are actually filming this um, live on Facebook. It's a bit of a test for us, so we'll give it a try and see how it goes. And I'd like to thank Jenny and Chris for agreeing for us to do that tonight. And I'd like to welcome our Facebook, any of our Facebook viewers. And to start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the people of the Widgibal Waibal um, Bundjalung Nation. So, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. I'm not going to say too much about um, either Jenny or Chris tonight because I went to a conference a couple of years ago and I had the absolute pleasure of introducing Arndo. And I had this deal that had been given to me, and he said, Joe, leave that to us. We're the ones telling the story. So, um, I would just like to first to say thank you to Jenny for spending the time with us tonight and agreeing to do this. Um, I was just talking to Jenny and saying we'd like to claim some of the fact that her interest with council began in Lismore with Richmond Tweed Regional Library because she began as a volunteer at the Lismore Library and then it all took off from there. So, and the other thing you may not know about Jenny is that she volunteers at the Byron Ross Writers Festival, so she's very much used to uh, coming along and uh, speaking with people and enjoying readers and writers with the same passion as most of us here do. So, um, and of course, you do our reviews, so thank you for that, Jenny. And Chris, thank you for coming tonight. Um, and agreeing to be part of our, our regional readers, our new program that we're doing. I saw uh, Chris at the Byron Writers Festival about two years ago, and I thought, wow, I'm going to go out and get Scrubland, so I went straight afterwards and bought Scrublands, read it, loved it, read it very quickly. Um, and when we had the opportunity through our RV digital platform, which I'll talk a little bit more about to do with the regional readers, and a simultaneous um, author opportunity, and I saw Chris's book, Silver, there, so I immediately thought, great, that's the one we have to have. So thank you for coming along, Chris, and I'll hand over to Jenny. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joe. Please, look, in thanking Joe, could we thank all the library staff who helped put this on tonight? Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Our regional library always will have a soft spot in, in my heart, and I don't think I could survive life without <laughs> books and without the library. So uh, thank you for, for everything. 
Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the people who told stories and had conversations and knew, had a sense of place before any of us was here. And, and I'm going to start by asking Chris a question about that in a moment. Um, there are toilets outside, just virtually opposite, and uh, a refresh rooms up the back, and I don't think anyone will mind as long as you don't clatter too much. To, if you feel like a top up of a cup of tea or coffee or biscuit, please get up and, and get that. What I'm imagining we will do is to um, have a conversation uh, for about 45 minutes and then open up for about 15 minutes of questions. So if you think of something, if you've got a bit of paper and write down your question as we go, if it's not covered, then you can ask it and we'll have this conversation at the uh, opening at the end. Does that sound all right, everyone? Good, good, good. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Chris with a little bit of background first, but I'm not going to give you a lot because I want our conversation to uncover um, some more things. First of all, as we've heard that this is the launch of the online book club, um, Silver is the first book in this online book club, but it's Chris's second. And if you've come in, and thank you for Book Warehouse for being here tonight, you'll see the two books up there, two novels, but they're not Chris's first two books. He's actually written two other non-fiction books. Scrubland, the two up here tonight are the two fiction ones. Scrubland's won the 2019 John Creasy New Blood Award for the first crime novel, for a first, at the UK Crime Writers Association Dagger Awards. And the books up there have actually got that on them now. Uh, when I read, you, you were in a, a short list, I think, or a long list for it, but then, so, then you uh, were awarded that. Before turning to writing books, Chris was a journalist for more than 30 years, covering federal politics and international affairs. So that's all for now. Um, as we say, more will be revealed. Uh, this conversation is aimed at getting to the why, who, where, how, and as I said, audience questions. Now, one of the things that I love about reading is that it can, a book can take you to a place. And that whole thing about setting and place is incredibly vivid in both your books, Chris. Now, Scrublands was in, you know, um, a, a mythical town or an um, imaginary town, made up town, what's the word? Fictional. Fictional town. <laughs> That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> River's End. It was a brown place, and you will get that by even looking at the cover. It's a brown inland place at the end of a river. I'm not going to say any more about that, but I'm going to ask you about that sense of place. And when you, we read Silver, it's clearly North Coast, clearly North Coast. There's lots of references to the North Coast in your books. How important is setting and place to your writing? I think it's really, really important. The strange thing is that I didn't really real, realise that when I started writing Scrublands. I was, um, as Jenny had said, I'd written these two non-fiction books. One's called The River, and it's almost like travel writing me, travelling through the Murray-Darling Basin at the height of the millennial drought. That gave me the setting, if you like, for Scrublands. And then I did a second book where I travelled down the east coast of Australia, which helped, I guess, with the setting of, of, of Silver. But I realised three things from writing those books. The first was I really liked writing. I'd always had the idea that it'd be good to be a writer and it'd be good to have a book and what a great sense of accomplishment it would be, etc. But the actual sitting down and writing the hard work of, of, of writing the words, I wasn't so sure about. But those books taught me that I really uh, liked doing that. The second thing I learned was that I could actually do it. I could get a book published. When you're starting to write, writing a book seems like quite an intimidating thing. You know, you write a thousand words, you think, oh boy, how long is a book? A hundred thousand words, something like that. The third thing that I um, realised and learned was there's no money in writing books. Uh, the average, I've since learned that the average Australian publisher author 
earns about $12,000 a year on average from writing books. So all those wonderful books and authors that you see in your bookstores and your library, most of them juggling two or three jobs or being supported by their partners, etc. So it's a very long-winded way of getting around to me writing Scrublands. I started writing it thinking almost as a retirement project. At some time in the future, I would, I would quit work and I could write books and I was, I loved doing it. I was confident enough to think I'd get published but never thought for a moment that I could make any money out of it. And I thought, well, what sort of book do I like? What would I like to write? And I thought, I'll cry a book. I quite like crime, and I thought I could do it. I, I wasn't so confident that I could write a, a really good literary novel, if you like. And I thought, what a crime book means, most of all, first and foremost, is a really cracking plot, okay? And, and I don't know if the plots in Silver and Scrublands are cracking plots, but they're kind of complicated yeah. plots. But what I realised, I learned a lot in writing the books, and one of the things that I learned was the setting. I always had this setting in my mind for Scrublands. The town there, River Sand, is, is a totally fictional town, but the setting is real. That far western Riverina in New South Wales, out of a hay plain where it's completely flat and there's no trees, and to the extent you can see the curvature of the earth. So I had, had that setting. What I didn't realise is a kind of in writing the book, because I had that image in my mind, it influenced the style of the book, it influenced the way I wrote it, almost subconsciously the words I chose. It also, in both books, it really explains a lot of the motivation of the characters. So in writing The River, I had spent a week in a small irrigation town out there on the Hay Plain or that sort of area. And the town looks nothing like River Sand except for one thing. It was an irrigation town and it had a bone dry river. There was no water. And that helps explain the motivation and the characters, right? It's a d desperate times. Desperate people in desperate times will do desperate things. So it helps to set up the motivation, the psychology and the morality of the characters. So having read, uh, having written Scrabble, and sort of reflecting back on it. I was fortunate last year, I, I went to the UK twice as Scrub Lounge was being, being published there. And um, it was a really amazing experience. I was chosen to go to this big uh, crime writing festival in, in Yorkshire, but I had some other events there that the publishers organised. The first one was an in conversation like this. Uh, except instead of Jenny, it was Val McDermott who was asking me questions. <laughs> so, Sorry. <laughs> so imagine how intimidating that was for a first time. Or, but, um, and then the next night in Newcastle, and um, there were two of us being interviewed, me and um, Anne Cleves, who's, oh. as you know, the author of Shetland and Vera Stanley, you know, she was asked about setting. And she, and of course, you know, the Shetland books, the setting is incredibly important to the book, to the, to the tone of the books, to the character, that sense of isolation, you know, the weather, everything. And she said that she thought that setting and character were more important to a crime book than the plot. Not as important, more important. And, and that made me think, I was thinking, well, could, could that be right? And then I thought of the, um, the, the Stig Larsson books that I read and enjoyed, you know, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And, but I read them about 10 years ago, right? So I can't really remember the plot of that first book, but I sure as hell remember the character, right? Elizabeth Solomson, yeah. So, and then um, just around that time, just as I go back to Australia, um, I was listening to the ABC Radio National, one of the book shows, and they were doing a segment on uh, page to screen, you know, adaptations, film and television adaptations of novels. And they're talking about Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep. And I always loved Raymond Chandler. He was one of the people who, who if you like, inspired me, thought maybe it'd be good to write a crime out of book. So he's, he's the hard boiled detective. So he, in The Big Sleep, 
Early on, one of the minor characters, a chauffeur, is murdered. But it's never explicitly stated who killed the chauffeur. And at the time of the scene, it was a bit of a masterstroke by Chandler that he hadn't spelt it out. He sort of left it to the reader to imagine who the killer could be. But then when they made the film adaptation, which was, you know, with Humphrey Bogart, one of those great, you know, Philip Marlowe sort of noir films, the scriptwriters wanted to know who killed the chauffeur. So they say to Raymond Chandler, who killed the chauffeur? And he goes, well, I don't know. <laughs> which, again, suggests for him, the plot wasn't the big thing. It was character and it was setting. And this came back to me again just recently. During, during um, when Silver first came out in October, I was doing a book tour. But Michael Conley, the great American crime writer, he's the guy who has the Harry Bosch books. He's published in Australia by Allen and Allen, and we had the same publicist organising our tour. So we had it at the International Library in Australia when I was doing Jenny's job, I was just asking the question. And he said every year before he starts writing his books, his, his um, Bosch books, because in them, it's not a country town, it's Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a real character in his books. He says he reads chapter 13 from The Big Sleep, from Raymond Chandler. And I say, well, why, what happens in chapter 13? He goes, well, nothing actually happens. It's just Philip Marlowe driving around Los Angeles, describing Los Angeles, which is a character in his book, it's the setting. So sorry for the really long-winded answer, but you, what I've realised almost retrospectively is, yes, setting is really important. And uh, as a person from the Northern Rivers, uh, and I know that our bookseller, Kaz, was saying she comes from Hay, and so she related to a lot in Scrublands. And I don't know, I'm Victorian, so I don't know that country very well, but I know this area, and so, I got excited when I read about how far south the cane toads and these are reference and this mythical town, fictional town is somewhere between Coffs Harbour and Lismore where the campuses of Southern Cross University are and you know this town might be the next Byron Bay. So there's lots of, Doug Anthony High School gets <laughs> mentioned in there. So there's lots of things to excite us. But just on setting, one of the things that you've done in both books is in the front of the book, there is a map of the town, a really detailed map of the town that, tell us about Alex and how you, did you describe where things were? Did you do a mud map and then you drew it? How did you actually come up with this really detailed map? Was that something in your mind's eye or did it evolve? Look, it, it was a matter of happenstance. When I was writing Scrublands, the town river scene is an imaginary town. So I've got nothing, no, I can't look it up on Google Maps. So I started drawing a map just for my own reference. So the buildings didn't change position. So when Martin walks between the motel and the police station in chapter three, and it's a five minute walk, it doesn't become a 30 minute walk in, you know, two years later when I'm writing chapter 23. So it's just a reference for myself. Now, all writers are going to have material that's not part of the narrative. So the one that crime writers will always have is, is come some kind of um, uh, timeline when things happen. So for example, the murderer appears in chapter three does he or she have time to go off, kill someone, dispose of the weapons, and then appear again in chapter five? You know, where are people when they're not in the narrative? That sort of thing. So any writer's gonna have a lot of stuff in the background. And that's what the map, the hand-drawn map that I did was simply as a reference for myself. Um, and then when I submitted the manuscript to an agent, I, I suspect it was because I was a little bit lacking confident that I described the town clearly enough. So I put my crude hand-drawn map in there and then later when it went to the publishers, um, it was there again. And so I discussed it with 
um, Jane Pothram, then, who's, who's my publisher at Allen and Unwin, and she liked the idea of the map. So we went, okay, let's do a map. So, I mean, my map was just, you know, this hand, you know, mess. Um, so Jane commissioned a cartographer to do a map, but it looked, it looked really, it just didn't work. And we realised that for a cartographer, of course, accuracy is all. That's, you know, that's what they do. They draw things in great accuracy, but they had no reference point. They couldn't look it up, the real location. That's when we thought, oh, we'll get an illustrator. And I'm not sure how Jane found Alex Potochnik, who's the artist who's done the maps in both ports. Uh, anyway, he sent through this, he, some of his examples, and they're fantastic, but there was only one problem. He's from Slovenia, he only recently arrived in Melbourne. He'd been before, you know, 20 years ago as a student, but he just arrived in Melbourne. So he'd never actually been to an Australian country town. And all these examples were these cute little villages in the Balkans, and <laughs> Dubrovnik and Spit and places like that. And as he was drawing uh, river scene, he had no idea what a country town looked like. So for those who have read the book, uh, particularly Scrublands. Martin, the journalist, the protagonist, is forever taking photographs of things as a reminder, as an aid memoir, as he's writing. Well, that's what I actually did when I was writing the non-fiction books, um, the river and the coast. So I had thousands and thousands of photos of country towns and the sky and the plaques and you know the colour of the sand and everything. So I could see, I had all these photos. So I could say this is what an Australian country pub looks like and. This is what wheat silos look like, and you know, he's saying, are they really that big? And I go, yeah. So, and I only got to meet him uh, recently after the publication of Silver, just before Christmas in, in, in Melbourne. So before that, and there was a lot of backwards and forwards because I've got drawn this map, but it, it is imagined. So he would come back and then I'd go, oh, no, there's this bit in the narrative where no, there's got to be something else there. So there's a, quite a lot of backwards and forwards, yeah. But uh, I've got to say, I, I really like the maps. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've got big maps. ones blown up at home. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking backwards and forwards, I had two bookmarks, one in the front where the map was, and yeah, yeah, fantastic. Look, I think you're quite right. In many books, um, the setting is a character, and it's very vivid in these. But I'd like to now get on to the plot. And we'll get on back to characters, actually, in a, in a little while, but the plot. Yours is, I think you were quoted saying, it's an immersive read, there's a lot going on. There is a lot going on in both books. How do you, what's the, the process of keeping track of what's going on when you are writing it? How do you actually do it? Can you share a secret? Okay. Um Without any spoilers, right? Without any spoilers. We're not getting into spoilers. You're not going to find out who done it or all yeah. that. So but I'm just, there's lots of stories in this. When I'm, so when I decided I'd try my hand at writing a crime novel, and I was thinking this is just pretty much for my own pleasure. So I thought I'd muck around with a few tropes. I didn't want, want to write kind of midsummer murders. Um, and, by, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to that, but it's one hour of television. And it has a very kind of formulaic plot line. Um, you know, you, you, you'll have a kind of a prologue. Someone's walking through some dark woods at night and then they feel someone's following them or something. Then you have the titles and the next thing you know, there's Barnaby arrives at the crime scene and forensics are there to tell him in the first 30 seconds, you know, the name of the victim, what they were doing, how they died, the time of death, etc., etc. There's a whole bunch of suspects. The one that, that you most suspect you find out is innocent or has killed themselves. And, you know, the most innocuous person is the one who did it. And there's a big thing, you know, okay? Um, one of the problems, it's great if you can bring it off, even if it is kind of formulaic. But one of the problems with that is when the reader guesses who did it halfway through the book, right? So then it becomes disappointing. I guess there's some satisfaction, oh, well, I got it right. On the other hand, there's nothing worse than getting you know, 10 pages before the end of the book and a whole lot of new information 
is brought in, or you know, new characters, and so you feel a bit cheated because there's no way you could have worked out who to write. So I thought, and this was another part, I think, of the decision to locate it in a small town. I thought, well, I'll have more than one crime. I'll have two crimes. And because it's a small place geographically, both the reader and my protagonist, Martin Scarston, is going to wonder, OK, are the two crimes connected? Was it the same perpetrator? If they are connected, how are they connected? And then, as, a st as I started, so I had that idea right from the start, and then as the story evolved, more criminality comes in, and it, and it ends up being four or five diff separate storylines sort of entwined um, in, the, in the book. Um, and they kind of changed over time. So I reckon by the end, <coughs> that no one, that someone might be able to guess one or two storylines, but no one's going to guess them all. And I say that with some confidence, because in writing the book, I didn't guess them all. <laughs> Thank you. That sort of answers the question I was going to ask, is how clear is it before you put pen to paper where this is all going? Um, not as clear as, not as clear as I would like it to be. So one of the things I've, I've learned over the last couple of years, um, in appearing at writers festivals and talking to other crime writers, is that there's this separation between the so-called plotters and the pantsers. And the plotters are the people who plot their books out very clearly and then and then write them, pretty much how they set them out. And then there are the, the true pantsers are people who start writing a book and they've got no idea how it's going to end up. And the really curious and interesting thing is, as you read the books, you've got no idea whether the writer is. So, Jane Harper is a, is a plotter. Michael Robotham is a pantser. And you could never tell because his books are very nuanced and they're balanced and they're pacey and all the rest of it. Lee Child and Helen Caban are very much pantsers. There's an American writer, James Elroy, who does, doesn't just plot everything out, he does this massive treatment. His treatment for a book would be three or 400 pages long. I'm thinking, well, before he starts writing the narrative. So he's absolutely... So my experience with Scrubland, as I was learning on the job, I threw out well over 200,000 words, and they, uh, which is, I do not recommend this. Um, and again, in Silver, though, things kept changing as I was writing. I was trying to plot it out, but what happens if you get a better idea? You know, you, you, you're making dinner or you're out having a walk, and you go, oh, but what if... So it does, uh, uh, for me, so this is my method, it does kind of evolve over time. And people who start off as minor characters, more or less as a plot point, oh, Martin needs to find out this, so he's going to run into someone who tells him. Suddenly they, they evolve and they become far more important characters than you think they might be. You know, it, 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 as I start writing the book, um, I'd like to be more of a plotter because it'd be more efficient, but not too much. Because there's quite a lot of work in writing a book. You know, there's a lot of time spent staring at a screen and typing and all the rest of it. So it'd be a bit disappointing if you put all that effort in and the book just ended up exactly as you thought, as you imagined it might be in the beginning. So I kind of enjoy the fact that they change in the writing. I've never heard the term pantser. I'm sure, I'm assuming you mean by the seat of your pants. Yes, that's exactly right. Writing by the seat of pants, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I don't know. Other people might have known that, but I didn't know. The first book actually, it, you, you took quite a few years to write that. Um, the first novel I'm talking about, Scrublands. Is that right? You took a couple of years to write that, but this one was much quicker. Is that because your circumstances were different or because you were clearer in your characters or what you want to do? What was the difference? Um, overwhelmingly circumstance. So Scrublands, I was writing part time. I had a very demanding job. Um, my wife's got a very demanding job. We've got kids. You know, that it's a struggle of you know everyone's life, right? So I was stealing moments late at night or on weekends. 
So it's scrubland sort of a row over about five years. And I had this mad idea to start with it and be it like a trilogy, as in storylines going over three books, which is why I ended up having to throw so much material away. Um, when I, then when I was fortunate enough, um, there was a kind of a, a so-called bidding war and auction for the rights to scrublands in Australia and again in the UK and again in the US. And both the Australian and UK deals were for two books. So I knew that there was going to be a second book. And the other thing is, I, I was, well, I was able to quit my job. I actually got sacked, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> what's good that is. Um, but I'm a full-time writer, which is a very, very privileged place to be in Australia. Um, so Scrubland took about five years and Silver took about one year. Um, but probably about the same amount of effort went into it if you throw away all that superfluous stuff that I, that I wrote for uh, Scrubland. Now let's get on to character. If Martin Scarsden walked in this room, would you recognise him and describe him for us? Because he's a character in both books. We're not giving any spoilers away. He's a character in both books. And tell us about him. Okay, so Martin is the central protagonist in both books. And we we see the world, if you like, through his eyes. It's not they're not told in the first person, they're told in the third person. But Martin is present in every scene. What's more, the reader can read what Martin is thinking, but you only get his impressions of how other people are reacting to situations and what he thinks they might be um, thinking. But because of that, he's not actually described to any great extent in the books, you don't know what hair colour he has, or whereas other people like like the, he's um, uh, like Mandalay Wong, uh, he, she's she's described. Other people have described in quite some detail. There's there's one scene in um, there's a suggestion that he's about forty, so you know that, and there's a suggestion that he has been uh, handsome, and maybe that's faded a little bit um, from not looking after himself so well. Um, there's a scene where he's looking in the mirror, but if you think of it when you look at yourself in the mirror, you know what you look like, right? So you don't describe yourself. What you notice is what's changed. So in this scene, he's, you know, his eyes are bloodshot and he's, he's sunburned and things like that. So that, again, that's not a, a description. So I, I know, I recognise the internal Marcus Garston, but what he actually looks like physically, um, I'm not so sure. His name, Scarsden. He's got scars, as in psychological scars. Now we're not giving away plot either, but he's a not an easy. He's not a simple character. He's quite complex. One of the things, you know, in, in set writing, I wanted to do is um, have some nuanced characters. So not you know, goodies versus baddies. And so even the people who commit crimes, whatever, they're not totally evil, there's some good in them. And, and Martin himself is not a saint. I mean, he gets driven a lot by his identity as a journalist and his desire to get the story. So that there's times when he, he sort of makes some rather dubious or compromised moral decisions because of that. Um, one of the things by the time I finished the book, that it wasn't really intentional and just happened as, as I was writing the story, but I found amongst the most satisfying thing in writing it, is that Martin evolves. So there's an emotional journey as, as well as all the crime plots. There's this, this personal emotional journey for Martin. So that the Martin Scars at the end of Scrublands uh, is a different man than he is at the start. He's becoming more self-aware and more emotionally engaged. Um, he's a bit of an emotional cripple, really, at the start of the book. He's like 40 and he's never had a proper sort of adult relationship, for example. And that continues, and I, I like that about the book. So that continues again in Silver, 
Um, and, and one of the differences between, there's similarities and differences between the two books. In the first book, Martin is an outsider. He's never been to the town of River Sand and he knows no one there. And his motivation for being there is very clear and that's to write a newspaper story. Now, as he digs into the town and starts sort of revealing its secrets, he realises there's a much better newspaper story than he, than he originally thought, but it's, the motivation is still clear. Now, in, in Silver, though, it's, it's quite different. The town of Port Silver is Martin's old hometown. It's where he grew up. He hasn't been back for more than 20 years because of traumatic events that occurred when he was a child. So, He's not an outsider, he still has relatives in the town and there are other people in the town who still remember him and his family. And his motivation is different too. Um, this isn't really a spoiler because it happens in the first chapter. Um, his partner, Mandalay Bond, has inherited some property including an old house on a cliff overlooking Port Silver. And so she decides she wants to get out of River Seine. She wants to live in this place, start a new life with Martin and her son Liam. Um, she doesn't know because Martin is such a deal he hasn't told her that it's his old hometown. He arrives and uh, goes to Mandy's, the town that she's renting while she fixes up the old house. Uh, and his old best friend from school is there, a guy called uh, Jasper, but Jasper's dead or pretty close to dead. He's bleeding out on the floor and Mandy's there with blood on her hand. And of course, the police suspect her of being the killer. And Martin doesn't believe that. Well, for, for most of the time, he doesn't believe that. Let's put it that way. So his motivation is different. He's, um, he wants to clear her name. But then, as the town starts giving up its secrets and he finds out more and more, um, he realises once again there's this fantastic newspaper story there. So his motivation starts becoming a bit conflicted between the, you know, the, 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 the two things. But again, there's this emotional journey. So again, he changes, he finds out what's happened to his family. There's just a hint at the end of Scrublands. Um, he's standing back on the bridge into town over the Dead River and it says, that you know, he, he sheds a tear, and this is part of his sort of emotional development, if you like. He sheds a tear, it's the first time he's cried since he was eight years old. Well, in Silver, you find out what happened to him when he was eight years old. Um, you've said before that the two books stand alone, but I think my advice would be if you're going to read them, read Scrublands first, because the their story continues and some of the characters continue. What do you say to people? I've said that. What would you say? Look, that's probably preferable, but... Um, not it, essential. It's not essential. It is typical with crime series with a, with a same protagonist that they can be read as standalone books. So that was the intention, if you like, when I was writing it. And I wasn't sure how well that worked, so it was kind of gratifying when I met readers who had read mm -hmm. Silver as standalone without reading Scrublands and, and really liked it and, and whatever. So it's it's not essential, but I guess if you had the choice of probability, it probably would make sense to read them in order. And there and there's a clear the events in Port in Silver happen a very short time after the events in Scrublands. Six it's to really, eight weeks or something. Right, so yeah. they're in close 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 proximity. Um, Australian noir has been described, and most of us know about Nordic noir. This is, it just seemed to be an upsurgence of Australian crime, particularly in rural and regional areas. We all know about the, you know, the traditional, I think, the Australian crime that have been based around Sydney or Melbourne. Is it, is this because it's a bit like when you're pregnant, you just you see more pregnant women, or when you've got a yellow car, you see more yellow cars? What is it? Do you see that there's a resurgence in in um, crime, and particularly rural and regional crime? Or if yeah, um, Laurie Oates, who I know from the press gallery, he's a he's a real crime tragic. He reads crime fiction. He calls it dingo noir. Oh, I like that. <laughs> which, which I like. Look, I think it was. There's certainly a lot of 
good dry books, Australian dry books set in rural areas. And I think there's a couple of things that played into that. One was, was this, that millennial drought, which made it, which recast the way we see the bush in the, in the cities instead of being this bucolic sort of place. Rather, it, it returned to that idea that it's rather threatening. So I think that's something that, that some writers picked up on. I think small towns do the work. It, it, it is interesting that there was a bunch of books that came out around the same time that were set in country towns. So Jane Harper's book, The Dry, but you know, her second book, Force of Nature, was set in the Grampians and it's rather wet. Uh, Sarah Bailey's book, The Dark Lake, well, her follow-up book with her um, police officer, Gemma Wood Woodcock, I think it is, was in, in a city, Melbourne. Mark Brady's really excellent book, Limmer, and his follow-up book, The Ripper, set in the city, Melbourne. Um, my next book, I think, is going to be set in Sydney. Uh, so it's, it's, I mean, Jane, Jane, um, Jane and Harper went back to the real outback for uh, The Lost Man. The Dry is more like a, a, a more like a farming community than, than a true outback community. I think one of the reasons it's done well outside of Australia, which is a really interesting thing, I think the success of Scandi Noir helped, particularly in America. But I think America is much more open to what for them might be exotic locations. When I first travelled through there, um, when I started in the 20, people away from the coast would never have heard an English accent because all the television, all the radio was American and there was nothing else. Now, because of the internet, because of Netflix and television, people are being exposed a lot to other other cultures. So I think Scandi Noir helped open it up. Um, the Dry was a massive success all around the world, and I think writers like myself and, and others uh, owe a debt of gratitude to Jane Harper because what it meant is when Scrublands came out, there were publishers in America sort of lining up to bid for it, and I reckon ten years before. I, I know some, some of the people who are writing, I think Michael Robotham wrote a, a crime book set in Australia and couldn't find a publisher for. Um, you know, back in the day, there, there were some successful Australian crime writers, but typically they didn't sell that well internationally. So, so things have definitely changed exactly why, who knows. Um, selling well to English speaking countries, how well do do they translate, or has there been an approach to translate yours into, say, a European language? Yeah, it's been translated by about eight languages, I think, France, Germany. It's doing very well in Norway, which I find really, you know, sort of a home of Scandinavian noir. Um, there's only about four million people. It's not a big market, but it's, good. Uh, it's been translated into Chinese, which is good. Uh, Russian, so I saw the cover for the Russian book the other day. So that's, I mean, that's, I, I was, one of these trips to the UK, my brother was living in Austria, and I, so I went across and saw him for a couple of days, and it was just the publication day in Germany, in, in the German book. So I went down to a local bookstore and bought the German, I, mean, I can't read all that of German, but it was just so nice to see it. I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll open up for quest uh, to um, questions from the audience. Um, you mentioned your third book, in and you were I, I had read pre-publicity that you were working on a third in the Martin Scarsden. Is that the one that you're talking about in Sydney, or is another one? No, that's the one in, in Sydney, and again features Martin and Mandalay, Mandalay Moore Mandy. The difference is, you know, I was describing the way that Scrublands and, and uh, Silver is told very much from kind of Martin's point of view. In the next one, it's alternating points of view. One chapter from Martin, one chapter from Mandy. So you get to see much more what's happening inside her head. Whereas at the moment, it's so uh, she's a bit, she's a bit, bit of a mystery. She's a bit, um, she's a bit hard to pin down. And when are we seeing it on the small screen? Scots, um, Scrublands or Silver. What's any progress there? 
Uh, so Scrublands was optioned for television around the time it was uh, published. This, this is quite common for things to be optioned, but whether or not they end up getting made, there's this whole complicated um, process. But I met with the producers, there's two Australian production companies involved with developing it last week, and they're very confident, they think it's making good progress. They're developing it in conjunction with Stan, which is you know like a Netflix streaming service, um, which is Australian owned, so I, you know, I like that fact as well. Um, and if that's finalised, then I'll need to get international partners, and then they can start. There, I can't mention the name, and it probably doesn't mean a lot, but there's a really very good director who's interested uh, in working on it, which is good because then that will kind of snowball. There'll be actors who want to work with them and that, you know, that sort of thing. So if all goes well, it might go into production at the end of the year, but who knows? I mean, it's, if it happens, it's terrific. If it doesn't happen, well, you know. Well, we all want it to happen, don't we? Yeah, I want to find out what Martin Scarston looks like. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And who plays him? Just on that, um, in, in this event I did with Anne Cleves, she was asked about what she thought about the actors who play her characters in the TV show. And she said, the guy who plays uh, what's his name? Jimmy Perez in the Shetland, in the books, she'd written a lot of the books first, and he's described as being really dark. And the rumour is he, he's the, his ancestor was a Spanish sailor who was shipwrecked on the islands. OK, it's really dark. But the guy in the TV series is really blonde, OK? So she says she, like, she has absolutely no problem with him as an actor and thinks he's excellent. But when she's writing, that's not who she sees. But she says with, um, with Vera Stanhope, that actor is so good that in her own mind, that is now the character. So it would be fantastic if some, you know, greatest, you know, unknown Australian actor came out and played Martin, and I started seeing, yeah. you know, imagining that person as Martin in the book. Yeah. Oh, we can hardly wait. Okay, <laughs> questions from the audience. Who's got a question? Yes. Just about the names of the characters. Um, <laughs> Martin, is he based on you? Because he was a journalist that got fired. Um. <laughs> yeah, the question for the audience at home is, is, is Martin based on Chris? Uh, he was a journalist who got fired. <laughs> um, well, Martin, he, uh, Martin he hasn't been fired at the start of Scrublands. Um, and I'd written Scrublands before I got sacked. And I didn't, I didn't really get fired. I just, Fairfax, Sydney Morning Hills probably got a quarter of the journalists that it had 15 years ago. And I was running a, a video production unit for them, and they just closed down all the videos. So everyone involved with video sort of lost their job. Um, Martin is a, Martin's informed by my experiences as a, as a kind of a roving foreign correspondent, but more so on, on the people who I met, you know, particularly frontline journalists and photographers, etc., uh, from conflict zones. A lot of people with post-traumatic stress. I think that's where I, I initially got the idea from him from. I do find it interesting. There's a lot of successful crime writers for former journalists. Mm. So Michael Robotham, Jane Harper, Michael Connolly, um, Val McDermott. The list goes on. But hardly any of them use journalists as their protagonists. They use psychologists or police officers or lawyers or whatever. I actually find a journalist is actually a really good protagonist um, because they've got a license to stick their nose into things. While we're on names, Mandalay yes. Blonde. Yes. So, you got to remember when I was writing Scrublands, I wasn't thinking I was going to be at Lismore Library explaining how I came <laughs> up with that. But I had this idea that maybe the book will get published, but that would be it. And you know, I was writing, I'd get a bit bored, so I was making up these rather ludicrous names. You know, there's a, there's a few kind of Dickensian sort of names, like Harley Snouch and people like that, Mandalay Blonde. And, um, and then when Scrublands did well, I was kind of cringing a bit. I thought, oh no, the names, I've kind of over-egged that pudding. Until at an event like this, 
a woman came up to me and said, I just love the notes, they're really fantastic. And I was a bit sheepish, you know, so thinking. She said, no, no, your plot is very complicated. There's like four or five plots going on, but the names are so distinctive, I don't have to go back and remind myself of who is who. And I thought myself as a reader, that happens to me, particularly you know, if you put a book down for a week and then pick it up, or there's a character that hasn't appeared for a hundred pages and you go, and then you, oh, all the names are kind of Tom, Dick, Harry sort of names. So I think in retrospect, the names actually were, as, as long as the reader's willing to sort of go with it, if you like, they're having distinctive names is probably a good thing. Yes. Another question, anyone else? Yes, Christine. So Christine just asked for the uh, uh, people watching at home uh, about the divide or the perception of a divide between rural and regional uh, people, and uh, is there a threat there? Is there a divide that's that's widening? Yeah. Look, I think I think there's sort of two contrary streams happening. I think because of modern communications, particularly the internet, the ability to Skype and communicate and whatever. Um, people, particularly in regional areas, are far more integrated in a way that they weren't. Um, I, I went to uni in Bathurst back in the early 80s and we were totally cut off from ev everyone. The telephone calls were too expensive. I'm, my father tried to get in contact with me one time and he sent a telegram. So people living in areas, particularly on the coast, are kind of a part in many ways of urban uh, urban Australia, particularly this sort of area, you know, certain between, say, Brisbane down around to Melbourne. It's not so isolated. There's certainly some economic issues there. Sydney and Melbourne in particular are getting so expensive that there, there are people who are kind of being driven out almost as economic refugees. So you will get towns out in the hinterland where people who are dependent, say, on welfare or minimum wage jobs, they'll move there so they can, you know, single mothers, that sort of thing, will go there because they can't afford the rent and the real estate. So that's that's certainly a phenomenon. Um, you say regional areas aren't as multicultural. That's, that's a stereotype that people in the city think, um, but some particularly the, the post-war irrigation river towns, you go to somewhere like Mildura and there's like 60 nationalities there. There's Afghans, there's Somalis, there's Vietnamese. It's not as stereotypical as you like. I went to, um, just after Scrublands came out, I was driving back through there. I was doing some, um, I, I was doing a little bit of filming uh, for a pro promotion for the American thing, and I stopped in Hay, and um, you know, which is way out there on the flat. They were having their own gay and lesbian Mardi Gras. Mm. So this idea that the regional towns are somehow disconnected from the from the rest of Australia, I'm not sure. Also, I think people in the cities, perhaps because of the drought, because of the bushfires. Um, maybe are more aware of what's happening in the rural. I mean, there's a lot of sympathy for farmers, I think, and the plight that farmers face. I mean, there was um, you know, a massive amount of money donated from people in the cities for, the bush, for bushfires, for example. So I'm not, I, I think it's more complicated to say that, that they're drifting apart. 
uh, I think in some ways they are, and in other ways, in other ways they're not. I mean, definitely, just in uh, wealth and income terms, they are. But, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, Ben. Hi, Chris. I'm Ben from the library. My question's just um, more from the publishing kind of angle. How much say do you get in the look of the book, of the book cover design, if any? Yeah, how much say do you get in the look of the book? Um, the editing process in books is incredibly respectful. I'm talking about the words on a page there, and it's, it's often a bit of a mystery. But for, for readers, but essentially nothing gets changed. Uh, only suggestions are made, if I put it that way, and then you can take them on board or not. That's the words on the page. But the covers and the titles and whatever, this is different, because it's this kind of arcane art, and I don't pretend to, uh, pretend to understand it, but you can tell a lot from, about a book from its cover. So in designing these books, they want, the, they want you to be able to pick up in a microsecond that it's a crime book. And certain colours, certain fonts have different meanings, sort of almost subconsciously. So if you remember a few years ago when Chick Lit was the big thing, you could re they had really distinctive colours, okay, and you knew immediately it was kind of like a you know, Bridget Jones diary type of book. And it's the same with horror, and it's the same with all sorts of of different books, so they want they wanted to fit into that. But on the other hand, when it sits on the on the bookshelf in the store, they wanted to stand out. So they're trying to make it fit in and stand out at the same time. So they always say, "What do you think of this cover?" And sometimes, but they'll have meetings in the publishing houses where they will debate at great length various iterations of covers, and you can see some covers are just brilliant, you know, they, they just capture the essence of a book so well. But that and the, the title um, can, Scrublands came to me quite late, I was, the working title was Riverscent and then I thought there was this location book, the Scrublands, I thought that's a much more evocative title and all the publishers agreed. Um, the Americans often change titles of books because it's a different sensibility, but I think the Americans have the idea of the Badlands. So in some ways, I think Scrublands resonates even more in the US than it might here or the UK. Uh, Silver, I just couldn't come up with a title. So there was this sort of bouncing backwards and forth. And the t I had the name of the town Port Silver. I think it must have been a bit of a play on, you know, the Gold Coast or something some silly idea like that. But anyway, they decided that silver would be a title at work. But of course, there's other considerations too, like has there been another crime book published anywhere in the world in the last year or two that's called silver? So you, if that was the case, you wouldn't want there to be confusion. But yet, the cover and the title are really up to the publisher, and I'm quite happy about that, because I really don't know enough about how that all works. Okay, we've got a last question. I think Karen. I heard your interview on the ABC the other morning with Joanne, and you were saying that you aren't ready or you're not going to politics as a top yet. If you get to that one, what level would you go at? Local, like Jenny Women, or federal, state, which one would give you the best deal? I, you know, I reckon some of the best stories would be in local government. Absolutely. I'll give you some ideas. <laughs> Everything's believable and, and, and also if it's set in a fictitious place, as opposed to say Canberra, you're not going to get sued for defamation. <laughs> um, yeah, I spent a, I, yeah, I first worked in the press gallery in the old Parliament House back in the sort of 1980s and I last worked there two years ago. So. Um, I know a lot about federal politics, um, but right now I'm sort of over it, <laughs> um, and that's why I didn't want to write. I was working there when I was writing Scrublands, so I didn't want to write about where I was working because I wanted to, to kind of escape, right? But like similar, like when you when you're reading, but at some point I may well, yeah, I, I, I may ha have an idea or something that works well 
problem in federal politics, but now you've asked the question, I, actually local politics mm. is possibly a yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we've had a real treat tonight. If you haven't read the book, uh, I encourage you to do so. Books, they're available for sale up the back, and I would like ask you all, there are still refreshments, but first of all, I'd like to ask you all to thank Chris so much for his time and generosity. Um, I think um, we might find out a little bit more now about how this book club might work. Jo. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to both of them. I've, I've seen Jenny uh, interviewing a few people now and she just, it's just lovely. Like, yeah, and it's just a really lovely conversation between the two of you. So um, I'd like you to both to say thank you to both of them, not, just, not so much Chris and, you know, Jenny. So. Yes. <laughs> um, I might just we'll just give the gifts now, Lucy, if that's okay. So we've just got a little token gift for the two of you for um, spending the time with us in uh, Northern Rivers, Chris. Thank you very much. This is just a, that's just a local taste of some of our delicacies from this morning. I tell you, my wife's going to love this. <laughs> She's going to say, yeah, do more of those. <laughs> now, just to tell you a little bit more about the Regional Readers Book Club. So, like we said, we this is our, our first um, book in the Regional Readers Book Club. So, we launched that on February the 14th. So, we've been gradually putting out teasers to get people interested in, one, reading the books and also getting an interest in these events so what we'll be doing in the next few days is starting to ask you your questions about about the book so we'll have um, questions coming through on Facebook so if you haven't already read the books um, there is access to the books through our uh, online platforms so you can go through the Richmond Tweed Regional Library app or you could go through the RB Digital app as well, through our website. There's various ways that you can access that. So I'm sure that any of the library staff will help you with that along the way. So just drop in or give us a call and we'll um, sort you out. But it's, it's fairly straightforward. Other ways that you can access a book, if you're a person who prefers hard copy uh, print, you can walk in the library. We have what we call our quick reads or popular reads. Uh, where you have um, one or two weeks to read the actual books. So I remember on Australia Day weekend, I walked into one of our libraries because I knew at that stage we knew we were probably going to be able to uh, have Chris up here. So I took one of the um, one week quick reads, and as you know, it's a pretty big book. And the staff said to me, You only got seven days for this. And I said, No, it's all right. So I had an extra day for the Australia Day weekend, so I immersed myself in silver that weekend, which was a great thing to do because it's such a, an Australian icon type of book. So thank you for that and allowing me to have such a nice Australia Day relaxing type of weekend. <laughs> um, so our intention is to give this a try, the, rich, the first Regional Readers Book Club and we're hoping to go forward with others along the way. So bear with us, there'll be lessons that we'll be learning along the way. That's a bit of a first for um, some of the areas. So one of the things I did want to say is the online version is simultaneous. So 20, 30 of you can be reading the same book at the same time. So you don't have to actually sit around and wait, which frustrates the heck out of a lot of people. Um, the other thing is, the conversations, they're not going to be at any particular time, so you don't have to um, jump in at you know, Thursday at 8.30pm. The idea is that people who have are short on time or you know they might be doing something one Thursday but then they'll read the next Thursday, you can jump into it whenever you want to. If, like me, you've read the books um, a little while ago, I, like I said, I read Scrublands when I first heard Chris talking about it, you can still join the conversation. It's not that you have to be reading it right now. So it's just a bit of a different way of doing book club. So, and I know with a lot of book clubs, people enjoy a glass of wine. So I'm guessing you can continue to do that in your own own place at the same time. So again, um, 
very big thank you to both of our conversationalists to, tonight and thank you for being part of this evening and I know the other two events were very well received as well, Chris. And uh, just, I guess, saying goodbye to our Facebook friends and hopefully we've kept them on board through this live event. Thank you. Thank you.